Okay, good. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. So hello everyone, good afternoon. We're glad that you could join us today for this webinar. So before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the participants from the variety of institutions. Well, uh, I gathered from the second form which I was sent, uh, which was sent to you together with the Zoom link. And first off, uh, to name a few, we have participants from the University of Abra, the University of Southeastern Philippines, Mindanao State University, the Bulacan State University. Uh, and if your institution wasn't mentioned, please type in the name of your institution on the chat box. And I will try to mention it during the open forum. Next, we have to acknowledge as well the international participants from the UK, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Costa Rica, Pakistan, Turkey, Mongolia, Thailand, and Canada. We also have participants from CHED and DepEd. Also, I'd like to say hi to those who are watching from the live streaming on the Facebook page of the PUP Guild of English Majors. Wow, uh, so we're glad to have such a diverse audience for this event, and we're looking forward to hearing from your, uh, your thoughts and insights on the topic that we have today. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today's presentation is hosted by the Doctor of Philosophy and English Language Studies Program under the subject ELS 707, Research in Social Linguistics at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines Graduate School with the guidance of Dr. Ruani Tupas, a special lecturer from the University College London alongside myself. This is the first webinar series of the PUP Doctor of Philosophy and English Language Studies Program on dual listening subjects, Filipino teachers contesting and reifying Western models of English language teaching. My name is Marisa L. Mayrena, your host for this intellectually stimulating talk and conversation. Good afternoon. Observing proper netiquette in a webinar can help create a professional and courteous atmosphere for everyone involved. The following netiquette tips can be observed. Listen and follow the moderator's instructions. Always mute your microphone to avoid contributing unnecessary and distracting noise to the Zoom room. You'll be given the chance to turn on your microphone during the forum. Prepare to turn your camera on toward the end of the program for the forum and future taking. Share meaningful insights and or questions in our Zoom and Facebook live chat boxes. Also avoid sending the same message multiple times. In addition, if you have any questions, concerns, or technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to send them through the chat function, okay? So the committee will do its best to respond to them as quickly as possible. Let's keep the discussion respectful and engaging. And by doing so, we can make the most out of this webinar and maximize our learning experience. This forum marks an unprecedented opportunity for all of us to engage in a vital conversation about the complex and often overlooked issue of how language and culture intersect in the classroom. As you all know, traditional models of English language teaching have been primarily based on Western norms and standards, which can often be at the odds with the cultural and linguistic practices of non-native English speakers. We do hope to enrich your understanding of the topic, challenge some biases, and provide an opportunity to venture beyond the typical paradigms of language teaching. So without further ado, let's get started. How about we raise our voices and sing the doxology?
Okay, so up next, we have the honor of hearing from the chairperson of the PUP Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in English Language Studies Program for his welcoming remarks, Dr. John Harold Malonzo. Everything has its first time. Sometimes it's nerve wracking, painful, and tragic. But most of the time, it's the most challenging and remarkable. It always compels us to learn and to progress. Now the PUP Graduate School's Doctor of Philosophy in English Language Studies program, in cooperation with the Guild of English Majors of the Department of English, Foreign Languages and Linguistics, would mark one of its exceptional first times. I would like to welcome you all to the first talk and conversation on dual listening subjects, Filipino teachers contesting and refining Western models of English language teaching with our esteemed resource speaker, Professor Roland Imperial from the Oxford University. I would also like to acknowledge and introduce our moderators, Dr. Ruwani Tufas, our visiting special lecturer from the University of London, Dr. Marisa Elmayrena from the PUP Graduate School, and Dr. Rafael Michael Opas, chairperson of the PUP College of Arts and Letters, Department of English, Foreign Languages, and Linguistics. I hope this day will not only leave a noteworthy first time for everyone, but also commence a hundredfold of learning opportunities not only to our faculty members, but most especially to our present and future PhD students to do well in this globally competitive society. So that was Dr. John Harold Malonso. Uh, thank you, sir, for the cordial reception given to the participants of this webinar. Everyone, it's now time for us to spotlight an exciting opportunity for those who are passionate about the English language and its impact on society. Let's hear more of this from the chairperson of the Department of English, Foreign Languages and Linguistics, Dr. Rafael Michael Paz. Gandang hapon, maraming salamat, Ma'am Isa. I am very happy to announce in behalf of our chairperson, whom you've just heard a moment ago, that uh, this year, We've recently started to offer, or um, this year we uh, started to offer two new graduate programs at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines Graduate School. So they are the Master of Arts in English Language Studies and the Doctor of Philosophy in English Language Studies. So these graduate programs are aligned with our undergraduate offering, our Bachelor of Arts in English Language Studies. So if you will have any questions about our new graduate programs, about the admission requirements and timeline, do not hesitate to send us a message on our social media pages. We have uh, the pages of our Guild of English Majors on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we also have our PUP English Language Studies uh, page on Facebook and our PUP Graduate School official page also on Facebook. So we will also take new students this summer term. Our summer term is from August to September 2023. And our first term for the academic year 2023 to 2024 will start uh, in September to October of the same year. So we hope to hear from you. If you'd like to know more details about our new programs, uh, we will uh, wait for your message on our social media pages. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rafi. So if you're someone who's passionate about English language studies and ready to take your understanding to the next level, look no further than the Doctor of Philosophy in English Language Studies program at PUP. Here in this program- Dr. Isa, sorry. Dr. Isa? Yes, sir. Sorry. There's one comment here that says there's no audio, um, but I'm, I'm hearing you, but I'm not sure about the others. Mm -hmm. um, can, can everybody let, let me yeah, know yeah. if you can actually uh, just a thumbs up or something like that because I'm not sure whether uh, it, this is only a problem with one. Can you hear me? Just one maybe, sir? Yeah, it, it's audible. So probably, yeah, probably Esperanza, okay. it's probably just your your system. Yeah, thank yes, you. Sir. Sorry about that. I just was yeah. just a little bit concerned. It's okay, sir. Okay, so we now move on to the most significant part of the webinar, 
And to introduce our research speaker, may I call in Dr. Romani Tupas uh, from the University of Calis, London. All right. Um, thank you. Maraming salamat, um, Dr. Isa. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, I, would, I don't want to talk a lot uh, because I, I am myself also excited um, and looking forward to, to the talk. So I'm, I'm actually very pleased and actually very happy that uh, our speaker, Mr. Roland um, Imperial, um, accepted our invitation to share his um, research um, with um, the rest of us. Um, Roland is, of course, a doctor of philosophy student, a Clarendon scholar at Jesus College at University. Um, prior to that, um, he was um, um, he taught at the Center for English Language Communication uh, of, at the National University of Singapore, also the same institution, the same center where I also worked for 10 years. So Roland and I actually have a lot of things in common. Um, he did his BA and uh, MA um, at the Department of English Language and Literature. Actually, also now I realize the same department that I, I, I studied in. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Roland has is a uh, work centers um, is, is centered on critical issues um, in um, applied linguistics and social linguistics in TESOL. Um, he has been, of course, in in this particular field for quite some time now, having taught in the um, you know um, in the different high institutions in Singapore, in the UK as well as in the Philippines. So, without much further ado, um, let me introduce to you, um, Roland. All right. Hi, <laughs> is it, am Hi. I, am I going to share my slides yes. now? Okay. All right. Sorry. That was, that's my, I uh, know that's my Sagada picture from last year. <laughs> um, I think it's this one. Uh, can everybody see my slides? My slide? All right, good. Okay, so, all right, I'm going to start. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here. And thank you to PUP for inviting me uh, to do this uh, talk, this presentation. It's a privilege uh, to be able to share a part of my doctoral uh, study that I'm currently actually working on. So, <laughs> so, uh, Comments, feedback, uh, very, very much appreciated at the end of the presentation. So, so the talk that I'm giving today um, addresses the continued minoritization or marginalization of Filipino online English teachers in the Philippines transnational ELT industry. And I basically do this by problematizing the politics of naming and labeling. That is the use of language and other uh, semiotic resources to construct, uh, organize, um, and uh, naturalize social categories. So in this presentation, I will explain how the ideology of the native speaker constructed through metalinguistic labels like native and non-native actually result in what I call bifurcations or segregations of English speakers into different groups or social categories. Um, and I will argue that these sort of bifurcations or segregations or classifications, subclassifications, uh, recursively constitute, in other words, reformulate, reconfigure, and maintain racial and colonial hierarchies in English language teaching. I'm gonna explore the mechanisms of this process by conceptualizing uh, Filipino English teachers as dual listening subjects that contemporaneously contest and reify the notion of what we call an idealized white speaking subject. So studies on the Philippines transnational ELT industry have traditionally understood systems of societal inequality and inequity from the lens of what we call native speakerism. And probably the most um, popular scholar in this field who's working on this field is Adrian Holiday, who characterizes native speakerism as a, a Western culture from which spring the ideals both of the English language 
and of English language teaching methodology. And in his most uh, more recent and scathing uh, revisitations to this controversial topic, Adrian Holiday even claims that native speakerism uh, damages the entire ELT profession, as well as popular perceptions of English culture. And that even uh, further says that research that labels groups into native speakers and non-native speakers and attempts to make comparisons between them. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, I think there is someone talking. And, uh, all right, so let me go back to that part. So basically, it says that research that labels groups in native speakers and non-native speakers and attempts to make comparisons between them is invalid research because these labels are not real labels. They are ideological constructions that do not represent real groups of people. And he even refuses to review any research now that uses the labels native and non-native unless they are critiqued as ideological constructs. So the term native speaker has always been very controversial uh, with several scholars like Robert Philipson uh, deeming it as a fallacy. It's not a real thing. And even scholars like Jennifer Jenkins says that, uh, say that uh, uh, the term native speaker is unviable or it's on, on linguistic grounds. It has no empirical basis. But Adrian Holiday, however, argues that native speakerism has a very real currency within English language teaching. And the prejudice that comes along with this is often obscured by what Ryuko Kobata uh, calls the apparent liberalism of a nice field like TESOL. Um, and other scholars like Keith Rose, who's actually my PhD supervisor, and uh, Nicola Galloway uh, also take a more nuanced view and acknowledge that even though the terms native and non-native are not identifiable realities, they are perceived realities for the majority of people who uh, use the language in English speaking countries or English speaking or English using communities. However, scholars like Kihano and uh, Dr. Rwani Tupas, who is in, in the room today, however, emphasizes that native speakers remains a durable ideology because of the enduring structures of colonialism that continue to perpetuate the term or the ideology itself within social institutions like education. And we can see this not just in mainstream schools in the Philippines, but also in supplementary teaching in institutions in Asia and in different parts of the world. So for example, like in Japanese Eikaiwa schools, in Korean Hagwons, uh, in the Chinese cram schools, and in the Vietnamese English language uh, centers. And we can see the traces of colonialism here because a lot of the teaching labor uh, that is being utilized in these uh, spaces are often outsourced to low cost labor exporting nations like the Philippines that have a long standing uh, post colonial history of English language education. And uh, there are several studies on the transnational ELT industry that have critiqued the terms uh, native speaker and uh, non native speaker as ideological constructs. Uh, Julius Martinez, for example, it problematizes the term half native English speaker, uh, half native English speaking teacher, or AHNEST, that is being utilized by this company called Universal Speaking. Uh, uh, so this company uh, basically uses the term HNEST to label and market Filipino English teachers on their website. So we can see HNEST as a sort of a metalinguistic label that is used to depict a contrast and comparison with the company's Canadian native English teachers and their Japanese non-native English teachers. And you can see in the slide, in, on the slide that there is even a visual representation of this uh, with a Filipino teacher on the far right, uh, the brown-skinned teacher as a half native teacher. So by analyzing the multimodal representations of these teacher, uh, these teachers on the company website, uh, Dr. Julius Martinez argues that the term half native uh, essentially perpetuates this idea of non-nativeness. He also observes that in the context of these HNESTs, the line between the privilege and marginalization is not always clear because not only do HNESTs experience both instances of privilege and marginalization, but they also experience them in different ways and in different situations. And another relevant work here is uh, Joy Hanapanaligan's and Nathaniel Minkaran's uh, work 
uh, on the concept of discounted nativeness, uh, which they utilize to locate a position of economic precarity, wherein Filipino online English teachers are bought at a low price, lower than what a stereotypically white English teacher would be paid for, the same type of work. But then these Filipino teachers are sold to learners at a higher price. So as discounted natives, uh, Filipino online teachers, English teachers, encounter uh, instances of discrimination like accentism and racism in their profession. Uh, the authors, for instance, describe how the teachers are often criticized for not sounding American enough and how uh, dark-skinned Filipino teachers are sometimes described as ugly by the parents of their East Asian students. And to make matters worse, Filipinos themselves are guilty of participating in acts of workplace discrimination. For example, Filipino company managers uh, would criticize teachers who speak with a regional or non-Tagalog English accent, for example, a Bisaya uh, English accent. So the authors also observe cases of what we call self or what they call self-discounting uh, practices. That is when Filipino online English teachers would express negative opinions of other Filipino teachers uh, or the quality of their teaching uh, of the teachers of Filipino teachers who work in the same type of industry. But in uh, the Char Konisha Charles's uh, critique of TESOL and ELT research, she argues that uh, ELT researchers who, uh, who look at the issue of native speakerism but avoid matters of race are negligent researchers because they fail to see and name the ways in which uh, their apparent racial marker privileges them to navigate this ELT space and access various modes of social capital. So I'm very compelled by this critique that Kunisha Charles makes because what I notice in a lot of studies in the Philippines that look at this issue of native versus non-native speaker or even just general issues of discrimination, the uh, discussions on race are largely absent, right? So I really wanted to utilize my research platform to better understand how representations of non-nativeness are co-constructed with representations of racial identity, of national identity and ethno-linguistic identity, among other intersecting in uh, identity, identities, yeah. And so I thought about this question is, is there another way to talk about issues of privilege and marginalization in ELT beyond the lens of native speakerism? And so I, I had two questions in mind. So as researchers, how can we identify racial and colonial hierarchies that are embedded in structures of ELT? And how can we develop a kind of research that seeks to dismantle racial and colonial ideologies and rectify societal inequalities and inequities in ELT. And so what I decided to do is I decided to adopt a language ideological critique of ELT research and practice. As someone who is not working as a teacher, English language teacher in these online spaces, I wanted to contribute to the discourse, but in a different way that I, that I, that seeks to critique and dismantle the language ideology of native speakerism. And I thought that uh, a language ideological critique would be a good place to start. And so I wanted to do a qualitative interpretative uh, approach to the study. And I wanted to do three things. So first I wanted to identify what subject positions Filipino teachers take. What are actually their views on the terms native and non-native? What do they think about these terms? And does it even matter to them? Second, I wanted to examine the language ideology of native speakers in itself. I didn't just want to describe depictions of native speakers and non-native speakers, which a lot of studies do. I wanted to go deeper and explain how these depictions are actually socially constructed. And in the process, I wanted to incorporate an, uh, uh, contemporary and uh, understandings of coloniality and race in my data analysis and interpretation. And so I turned to linguistic anthropology, I, ideas in linguistic anthropology, uh, specifically the theory of the listening subject. 
So the concept of the listening subject was first developed by Inoue Miyako in her groundbreaking 2003 paper in the Journal of Cultural Anthropology. So she conceptualized uh, male intellectuals in the Japanese Meiji Restoration era as listening subjects, overhearers in lay terms, uh, who overdetermine the language use of a particular social group that is the Japanese schoolgirls. Um, and these male intellectuals uh, basically constructed a social category called schoolgirl speech, which according to them was unpleasant to the ears, which at the time reflected a kind of a stigmatizing gendered discourse that attached or indexed undesirable ideologies to the Japanese female identity. Uh, for, and so for In Inoue Miyako, schoolgirl speech is not exactly an empirical type of speech. It's not something that you can actually objectively define, but rather it was a language ideology that was manufactured or socially constructed by these male intellectuals who by their authority in the social order positioned themselves as listening subjects of these schoolgirls. And this listening subject is a privileged position because they're able to overhear a gendered other. Uh, and so Meiji intellectuals constructed discourses that aimed at specifically stigmatizing schoolgirl speech, branding it as a symbol of linguistic corruption, the cultural loss of an authentic women's language. And so they were bluntly speaking, engaging in some kind of culture of misogyny against these uh, Japanese women. And so uh, um, in order to, for us to have a better uh, visualization of how the subject, the listening subject position works, we, uh, this is a kind of an illustration that um, I have here on the slide. So these Japanese male intellectuals occupy or take up this particular listening subject position, it's not a it's not a real position. It's an it's an ideological construct. It's a it's a position that they take in their minds, right? Uh, and they engage in this act of overhearing Japanese women. And in the process of overhearing Japanese women, they engage in this construction of two subcategories of Japanese women: the modern Japanese women and the Japanese schoolgirls. And this is what we call a process of bifurcation, where uh, social category splits into two subcategories. And in this process of bifurcation, um, linguistic features are essentialized as iconic representations of these social groups. So for example, being pleasant sounding is associated with the modern Japanese woman. Uh, the modern Japanese woman is someone who it has a potential to be a good wife or a good mother. And a, the modern Japanese woman signifies social order. Meanwhile, the Japanese schoolgirl, uh, the voice that they produce, that the voices that they make are unpleasant to the ears. It's a linguistic corruption. It's a type of noise. It's vulgar and it's a, tr it's a threat to the social order. So we can see here that there is a co-naturalization of language, not only language, but language, gender, and social class. So we can see here that uh, the linguistic features and the social features are kind of essentialized with one another. And these essentializations create depictions of social contrast, social difference between these two different types of social subcategories. And in Angela Reyes's excellent application of the concept of the listening subject, she explains how present day post-colonial Philippine society continues to produce colonial distinctions between apparently naturally opposing social categories. And so, so such colonial distinctions can be visibly and audibly observed in the bifurcation of the elite, Philippine elite category into two post-colonial elite types that occupy, occupy different listening subject positions. The Konyo elite that embodies a life of corrupt lifestyles and consumer excess, akin to the Taglish speaking Philippine mestizo elite and the middle class elite that stands in stark contrast to the Konyo elite by its virtue of being an anxious and moral middle class. So here we can see the middle class elite engaging, uh, taking up a listening subject position, engaging in an act of overhearing uh, uh, this category called Philippine elite 
and in the process bifurcating this category into, su into subcategories. So now we can see that the Konyu elite is now associated with linguistic features such as being maarte, dramatic, like make tusok tusok the fishbowl. Uh, it's also essentialized uh, uh, certain physical features such as being mestizo or being light-skinned and also some attitudinal features such as being entitled whiny, goes to Ateneo or La Salle, being excessively consumerist, engaging in an immoral lifestyle. And so this creates a sort of depictions of social difference between the Konyo elite and the middle class elite, with the latter uh, trying to distance themselves from this Konyo elite because they uh, have negative connotations associated with them. And also drawing from Inoue's, uh, Inoue's theory of the listening subject, uh, Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa argue that in the United States, the bilingual English language education programs uh, actually put language minoritized students in a racial positioning that frames their linguistic practices as deficient, regardless of how closely they follow supposed rules of appropriateness. So in this case, uh, the notion of appropriateness is based on the idealized white monolingual list uh, speaking subject. And so bilingual students from minority language backgrounds or from immigrant families are coerced or compelled to model their linguistic practices after this idealized white monolingual speaking subject, despite the fact that the white listening subject continues to perceive their language use in racialized ways. So what Jonathan, Ro uh, jo Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Forrest are saying here is that it does not matter whether these bilingual students are actually speaking English well, or, in, or using English very well in a variety of communicative situations because they will always be racialized and they will, they will always be perceived as different from white monolingual English speakers. And that's where the notion of race comes in here. So now that I have introduced my conceptual frameworks, the listening subject, uh, bifurcation and racial linguistic ideologies, I now ask these research questions. What listening subject positions do Filipino teachers take amid their assumed or perceived status or status as non-native speakers of English? How do the subject positions construct contrasting depictions of nativeness and non-nativeness? In other words, how do Filipino teachers utilize language and other semiotic resources to depict and essentialize social and linguistic differences between native and non-native speakers? And how do these listening subject positions contemporaneously contest and reify ideologies of linguistic inappropriateness or even linguistic incompetence? So the participants' uh, data and findings that, I, that I'm going to be presenting in, in, this, uh, uh, in this talk are part of a much larger study uh, that I'm currently doing right now that seeks to dismantle language ideologies and legitimating new subjectivities in transnational ELT research. So I'm going to present uh, my qualitative analysis of semi-structured online interview data that I have co-generated with four Filipino women, uh, pseudonymized as Danica, Francis, Heidi, and Christine, uh, who are all very highly experienced English teachers uh, with several years of online freelance teaching experience. And at the time of their interviews, they were working as independent contractors for a Japanese company that I'm going to call as NARA for now. Uh, NARA is a private Japanese owned ELT company with base operations in the Philippines. It's an online Eikaiwa uh, school, uh, basically an English conversation school. Uh, and so uh, Francis, Heidi, and Christine uh, work as full-time independent contractors, while Danica uh, is a full-time nursery and kindergarten teacher uh, who, teaches, who teaches with NARA uh, part-time. So to understand how Filipino teachers adopt uh, listening subject positions, it's first uh, important to understand how the process of bifurcation takes place at the level of the company, right? Because they work for these companies. So it's, it's crucial to understand how NARA, the company itself, uh, utilizes language and other semiotic resources to create ideological representations of their teachers. So if you can see from the slide, NARA promotes its Filipino and Japanese teachers 
in an overall positive manner. Why is this? It's because NARA doesn't actually hire white teachers. They don't have, I'm not sure if they do have white teachers, but overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly they hire Filipino teachers and several Japanese teachers uh, uh, to teach English to Japanese students. So because their main marketing strategy is to hire Filipino teachers, they have to promote them in a positive manner. And so you can see from the slide, uh, although NARA explicitly labels Filipino teachers as non-native speakers of English, they are also depicted as advanced teachers who possess a high level of English language proficiency. Uh, they have a high, they have tertiary education experience. They are marketed as empathetic to Japanese English learners due to their similar uh, second language learning backgrounds. And NARA also emphasizes that its Filipino teachers are trained by also Filipino instructors who are TESOL certified. And more importantly, Filipino teachers are depicted as highly suitable teachers uh, for Japanese students due to their national character of being very hospitable people. So this is described in contrast with the depiction of Japanese teachers as basic to intermediate teachers who are capable of bringing peace of mind to beginner to intermediate learners of English who might feel uneasy about um, speaking only in English or those who wish to understand accurately what they cannot hear in Japanese. So you can see here that there is a bifurcation of the Filipino teacher, uh, of the non-native teachers into Filipino advanced teachers and Japanese beginner to intermediate teachers. And so what is happening in the case of NARA is that linguistic representations of non-nativeness co-naturalize with or co-construct with idealized notions of race, national identity, uh, language proficiency, teaching ability, and even quality customer service, hospitality, and empathy, which in turn results in the bifurcation of the non-native category into advanced non-natives and beginner to intermediate non-native teachers. And even more importantly, what we can see here in this uh, illustration is that this process of bifurcation essentially reformulates the same ideological constructs that segregate non-native English speakers from native English speakers at the very first place. So in other words, despite all the positive marketing, all the positive promotion of both Filipino and Japanese teachers, uh, schools like NARA, even with the best intentions, continue co to contribute and maintain racial and colonial hierarchies in ELT practice, even without overtly representing some idealized notion of a white listening subject. And this is a very important consequence on how Filipino English teachers position themselves as listening subjects. So my interviews with the four uh, Filipino teachers will reveal uh, similar ideological representations that recursively constitute or uh, maintain racial and colonial hierarchies of non-nativeness in English language teaching. So first, Filipino online English teachers position themselves as listening subjects of a racialized and minoritized other, as, some, as teachers who occupy a de facto position authority as advanced teachers, they take up this listening subject position that allows them to evaluate the sound of, the, of a language minoritized other that is the Japanese student. So this listening subject position, I argue, remains rooted in enduring racial and colonial structures of the ELT industry. So take, for instance, the following statements made by Danica and Francis. So Danica says, so yeah, actually, what I always tell them is that you really have to surround yourself, for example, American English speakers, if you really want to understand them. Because with me, I'm a, I'm a secondary English learner speaker. So you can easily understand me and I, uh, according to my student. And then Francis also says, so for me, I think that the most natural way to learn a language is through conversations with a native speaker of that language. When I'm teaching and they usually ask me, ah, Tudor Francis, how can I, how can I be more confident in speaking English? Lagi kong sinasabi talaga, I always say to really watch English TV shows, watch English movies, listen to songs, English songs. So the word choices and overall language use in these two extract, excerpts, interview excerpts 
reflect how shared representations of nativeness and non-nativeness work in tandem to essentialize notions of linguistic appropriateness that are fundamentally rooted in Western models of English language learning or Western native speaker norms. Even though Danica and Francis here, uh, as, as if you can see, they clearly position themselves as non-native English speakers, they utilize their de facto authority as advanced teachers to recommend self-regulation learning strategies that are clearly oriented towards a white, an idealized notion of a white speaking subject. For example, uh, surrounding oneself with American English speakers and regularly consuming Western English TV, film, music, and other types of media. So um, even tutors like Christine and Heidi also specifically use uh, codified American or British pronunciation norms as a benchmark for standard English pronunciation and a guide for corrective feedback provision. So when I asked Christine whether she specifically teaches uh, US American pronunciation in her lesson, Christine says, uh, there are different kinds of pronunciation, like let's say the word often. So in American pronunciation, we pronounce it commonly often, but then in English, it's also acceptable to pronounce it often, which is an, another type of accent too. But both of these are generally, are, are actually acceptable, but generally American English or the American English accent or language are the most common language that non-native usually use when they are learning the language. Um, Heidi also says, ah, ginagamit ko yung Cambridge, usually pag advanced, yun kinakorek ko talaga. Ito dapat yung pronunciation. Pero pag beginner lang naman din yung student, basta naiintindihan ko yung pagpronounce nila, parang okay na rin. So basically what she's saying is that, uh, so the translation is, I uh, use the Cambridge Dictionary and usually when the student is already at an advanced level, uh, she really tries to correct them. And for example, this is how the word should be pronounced. But when the student is just a beginner, if she can understand their way of pronouncing, that's fine by her. So we can see here from, uh, from these excerpts about, uh, that the online classroom actually provides a space for these Filipino teachers to at contest or at least work around, work their way around uh, dominant language ideologies. For example, Christine trying to expand the range of acceptability for uh, English pronunciations or Heidi uh, giving more leeway um, for beginner students to make pronunciation mistakes or errors, mistakes or errors in inverted commas. So Danica also finds a sense of legitimacy in her teaching uh, because of her and her students' shared language learning experiences as illustrated below. Danica says, I always, we always mostly talk about it, talk about this one during my lessons as well, because some students, they will say, oh, why can I understand you easily, but I can't understand my American coworkers, my British coworkers like that. So I always tell them because we are, we are both second English learners. So I think we have, in a way, we have the same way of how we learn the English language. Here, uh, Danica's use of the phrases, we are both second English learners, and we have the same way of how we learn the English language can be seen as uh, her trying to downplay her expert identity and foreground her non-nativeness as a shared identity between her and her Japanese students. This process is something that I call a type of reverse bifurcation, which works in Danica's favor because it allows her to first foreground and prioritize her non-nativeness to build rapport with her students. So here, the idea of non-nativeness actually works in favor of Danica. Francis, on the other hand, attempts to fix the bifurcation of non-nativeness by simply erasing it and feeding into her students' idealized notion that Filipinos are native English speakers, even if she does not actually believe in this language ideology herself. She says, I think for me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm a native speaker, right? But I think the perception of the students matters the most. Yeah, parang yung perception ko sa sarili ko, hindi ako native speaker. She says, I feel like my perception of myself is that I'm not a native speaker, but my students perceive me as a native speaker. So I think I help them that way. So Danica and Francis's ideological reversals and erasures here 
however, are problematic because they simply result in other forms of co-naturalization of language, nationality, national identity, and racial identity that continue to shape discourses of or constructions of incompetence. For instance, Danica's statements, we are both second English learners and we have the same way of how we learn uh, the English language, are illustrations of how her idealized notion of non-nativeness only serves to further cement the segregation of English speakers into natives and non-natives. Um, here, both Filipinos and Japanese English learners continue to be minoritized, racialized, and collectively seen as deficient, and therefore in need of appropriate remediation strategies to improve their proficiency in English. And perhaps even more interesting is Francis's kind of uh, misalignment with her perceptions of herself and the students' perceptions of her. This to me is a clear and concrete example of how notions like native speaker and non-native speaker are fundamentally racial linguistic ideological representations of social difference. And that these indications of social and linguistic difference are basically markers of incompetence, even though these representations are difficult if not impossible to locate empirically in the classroom. And so the duality of the listening subject takes place when the Filipino English teachers become listening subjects of their own selves. So this can be seen as the other side of the same listening subject position, hence the duality that, tutor, that these teachers adopt when teaching foreign students and making judgments about their language and communication skills. So my argument here is that Filipino teachers serves as listen, serve as listening subjects of their own selves because they're always conscious about how they sound. Francis, for instance, uh, claims that had it not been for her teaching job at NARA, she wouldn't have been able to gain confidence in her English speaking skills because she grew up learning in a pub, Philippine public school. Uh, and Danica, on the other hand, is also aware that her English is not some authentic kind of English because it's not the kind of English that's being spoken in America. She says, if we say authentic English is being spoken in America, then no, I don't think I can teach American English or authentic English because you know we have Filipino English, although we don't use it during lessons, but the way we speak is in a well-paced compared to other native English speakers. So in that case, no, I can't teach authentic English. And the fact that Filipino tutors can overhear and over determine their own language use also leads them to subject themselves willingly to language minoritizing practices like accent modification, and pronunciation training, which are often veiled under professional self-development discourses like upskilling, reskilling, uh, and this act of self-discrimination or self-minoritization not only um, essentializes native speakerist and white supremacist logics, but it also justifies uh, online freelance teaching work as something that's both empowering and emancipatory for Filipino teachers. Uh, Heidi, for instance, recounted her experience of willingly subjecting herself uh, to shadow training to neutralize her English accent, which she describes as literally pangit, which is a Tagalog word for ugly. She says, Pag pinapakinggan ko yung sarili ko kasi mahilig ako mag-shadowing, nag-shadowing ako ng tatlong taon, narinig ko yung salita ko, parang sabi ko, ang pangit, and then she laughs. Parang sabi ko, pangit, sorry, so I repeated that. Ang pangit naman ng, ano ko, ng accent ko, kaya kinokorek ko. So she says, I really did shadow teaching for three years. I could really hear how I speak. I thought it was ugly. That's why I tried to correct it. So Heidi's willingness to neutralize her accent stems from her linguistic insecurity, right? She of her linguistic, particularly her ethno-linguistic identity as a Visaya speaker. So in the Philippines, it's very important to contextualize here for our audiences who are not from the Philippines. Bisaya speakers are often acoustically perceived as low prestige and socially and culturally inferior to Manila Tagalog English bilingual speakers. Christine, who is also a Bisaya speaker, uh, is also self-aware of the social and linguistic differences between Tagalog and Bisaya speakers of English. She says, I'm not sure if Filipino English is closer to American English. I'm not really sure about that. 
I mean, I think the reason uh, is because Filipinos tend to know different kinds of dialects and we were able to adjust directly when in terms of English. In my case, I don't usually speak like this in my native language. So at this point, she's kind of like trying to adopt an Americanized accent. I'm Visaya, so I'm like stuck, you know, even when I speak, I'm like starting a fight. I'm like angry in my native language. But then when I speak in English, this is me. But if I'm going to put my accent, my Visaya accent in English, it would sound different. So Visaya speakers like Christine tend to be a lot more self-conscious of how they sound in English than Tagalog speakers because of the various negative ideological representations that have been co-naturalized with the Visaya language itself. Uh, in the case of Heidi, it's quite astonishing actually that she would think of her language skills as very lowly because she is actually fluent in five different languages. She speaks Bisaya, Tagalog, English, Ilocano, and she even speaks Igorot, which is the language spoken most only by mostly only by the Igorot tribe in the Philippines' uh, northern Cordillera region. Uh, she lives uh, in, in Baguio City. So instead of celebrating their multilingual identities, two teachers like Heidi and Christine are actually forced to adopt accent modification strategies in an effort to improve their teaching pedagogy. And so the professional choices that these Filipino tutors make are really constrained by the social context that not only determines which options are available to them, but also frames these available options as inappropriate or appropriate. And these available options may, like accent modification, may, it may seem appropriate on the surface, but it really compels English minor, language minoritized teachers to perceive themselves as deficient, and therefore they have to kind of like fix themselves. And so now I turn to my uh, discussion. Uh, so basically what I'm trying to say in this presentation is that if we limit our conceptual and analytical frameworks to just metalinguistic derivatives of native and non-native, it only serves to obscure the experiences of privilege and marginalization of these Filipino English teachers. So to critique the ideol ideology of non-nativeness in, in ELT is to really break out of this ideological box and to focus on the uh, indexical processes that actually essentialize these sort of social differences between different social categories that are perceived to be natural, apparent natural oppositions of each other. For example, native versus non-native, standard versus non-standard, white teacher versus non-white English teacher, advanced Filipino teacher versus beginner to intermediate Japanese teacher. And so the, so I'm trying to argue here that maybe one way to, maybe one way to do that is to look at the duality of the Filipino listening subject. So the bifurcation of language minoritized groups into new social categories uh, beyond the native versus non-native dichotomy, for example, advanced versus beginner to intermediate, only further essentializes these apparent natural oppositions. And they basically reinforce or uh, maintain uh, racial and colonial hierarchies. So for example, when Filipino teachers are labeled as advanced teachers, uh, they project essentialized characteristics of the idealized white listening subject and onto their students, even though the entire ELT industry continues to hear these teachers in racialized ways. And as language minoritized groups, like Filipino teachers, they are also obligated or coerced or compelled to hear their own selves and project the same idealized notions of native speakerism onto themselves. And it's very important to also uh, factor in the role that Japanese students play in this space. The Japanese students I would interpret serves as an acoustic mirror or an auditory double through which Filipino teachers actually hear their own non-native voice. And this results in fractured and unstable subjectivities like Heidi, who thought that her accent was terrible, was ugly, and so this kind of essentializes a sense of inauthenticity or illegitimacy that must be neutralized, reduced, or approximated closer to some uh, idealized notion of white monolingual native speaker norms. And so we really need to redirect our efforts in finding unexplored spaces of intervention and transformation, uh, which is what Dr. Rwani Tupas has been advocating for. And I think one way to look at this is also at, in, uh, in, in our own home turf, 
like we need to problematize the valorization of Philippine English at the expense of mother tongue subjects. And we need to address contradictions and co-naturalizations of language, race, and coloniality. We need to ask ourselves, should we encourage language minoritized speakers to upskill themselves and achieve, achieve native-like proficiency, right? Because um, uh, this has a lot of ethical and moral repercussions in, ethic, uh, in ELT research and practice. And so we, there's a lot of work that is needed towards the realignment and rectification of societal inequalities in the ELT industry. And so maybe one way to do that is to develop uh, new ways of thinking outside of the traditional native versus non-native dichotomy so that we can better acknowledge our teachers' li lived experiences of privilege and marginalization and better value their contributions to uh, both ELT research and practice. And by that, and uh, so, yeah, yeah. So thank you for listening. Uh, and that uh, concludes my presentation. Well, uh, well that was, uh, that was... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, yes. uh, thank you so much, Roland, for that enlightening discussion. Uh, your research, of course, your ideas and perspectives are needed as we navigate the ever evolving uh, landscape of English language teaching. So everyone, I know our research speaker did an amazing job. All right. So let's show some appreciation by reacting and or sending some emojis. Okay, so I can see hearts. Okay. Oh, hearts, yes. Okay, so, okay, more reaction from the audience. Thank you, guys. So now moving on to the forum, to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to speak, we request that you type your questions or comments in the chat box and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible in the meantime, you know, uh, in the time that we have remaining. So this will allow us to address your queries and concerns accordingly. However, if you prefer to speak up and share your insights out loud, please uh, raise your hand using the hand raising button or physically by raising your hand on the camera. Okay, so uh, we kindly ask for your patience as we try to acknowledge each raised hand one at a time. Okay, so uh, let me see. Questions? Oh. Doctor Isa, there's one question in the comments. There's one here, sir. Oh. Yeah. It says by from Rina. Do you want me to ask that question? Okay, there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, from Rina, I have read a lot about Filipino online English teachers feeling exploited because of mm -hmm. the offered compensation to them. Uh, any advice as to how to address this through research? What evidence should we provide that we are capable in? what we do and how can we stop this way of thinking? Sir Roland? Wow, that's, <laughs> I feel like that's more of a policy uh, research question, which I, I'm not uh, an expert of because I don't do policy research. But um, I think one good place to start is to uh, question the, like I said, the politics of naming and the kinds of labels that we put uh, on teachers because the labels do matter. So in one of the slides that I, uh, that I showed, uh, there was the slide of uh, Amer an Amer a white American and a white British teacher that was labeled, labeled explicitly as a native. There was like this kind of sash on top of the profile picture that labeled them as natives. And then the other two teachers, there was one, one Filipino teacher and one Lithuanian teacher. And they, were, they, they didn't have any labels, which effectively 
cl classifies or categorizes them as non-native. And in the type, this type of industry, to be classified as a native teacher, it automatically stratifies you at a higher salary grade, right? So native teachers get higher pay and non-native teachers get a lower pay. So, so the exploitation also comes, so in, in this case, the exploitation comes from the labeling of native teachers and non-native teachers. So how do we address this to researchers through by actually critiquing these labels and saying that these labels are problematic? But what my presentation also shows is that other types of labels are also problematic. So for example, like advanced teachers versus beginner to intermediate teachers. And also that reflects different levels of pay, salary, right? And I'm pretty sure that Japanese teachers, even if they teach uh, beginner to intermediate, would be paid a lot more than Filipino teachers, right? So how do we uh, address this through research is really by critiquing these sort of social structures that perpetuate these sort of so, uh, these economic inequalities uh, between Filipino teachers and other groups of uh, English teachers. Yeah. Um, and I think one important, uh, one important thing that we should be really doing is to actually talk to these companies, right? So researchers have to communicate and co and work with these companies to in, in an effort to kind of change their mindsets about how they frame and how they market and how they publicize their Filipino teaching workforce. Yeah. So there's not a lot of, of, of communication between um, ELT researchers and practitioners as far as my fieldwork experience goes. So when, when I, last year I went back to the Philippines and I spent a year there uh, and I was like, work, uh, I was co co-generating uh, my interview data with uh, 50, 50 teachers from different schools. And what I noticed is that a lot of these schools have these sort of really discriminatory exploitative practices that have been kind of taken for granted, right? And so I think a lot of this really has to start with companies trying to offer better compensation for teachers and marketing them in more and in, in better ways that don't frame them as them being that Filipino teachers are very easily exploit exploitable. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Roland. Uh, we do not have uh, Sir Rafi. We have questions on the Facebook Live. Yeah, I have um, a few questions here from the pre-registration form. However, I'm afraid that they are not really that much related to uh, the topic that was delivered. More of the questions have to do with English language teaching. And I imagine that Roland will have um, perhaps uh, difficulty addressing them. But I will share some of them later for Roland. But perhaps if I uh, deliver the questions from our pre-registration form, I'd like to share something and also ask a question to, to Roland. Um, your, uh, of course, I'd like to first um, thank you for your uh, presentation. It was uh, very clear and very wonderful. So the investigation that you presented reminded me of uh, research that uh, one of our students at PUP um, finished um, just a few uh, months ago. But hers is about uh, Filipino ALPs in Japan, assistant language yeah. teachers in Japan. I remember an excerpt in her transcript where one Filipino ALP recalled how non-American English-speaking ALP struggle with teaching English uh, since Japanese schools favor American English more than any other varieties of English. So no matter if the native speakers of English, and I put that in quotation marks, are fluent in English and perhaps even teaching English, they are all also perhaps uh, discriminated for the lack of a better, for, of a better term. Of course, not as much as, uh, you know, how the non-native speakers of English, and I have to put it again in quotation marks, are exploited. So perhaps uh, because of, um, you know, um, the status of English as a globalized variety, this happens. And, and I'm wondering if this is uh, another layer of bifurcation um, between or among um, quote-unquote native speakers of English. Like the American... Teachers? Yeah, like um, yes, like um, among uh, what we call native speakers of English or uh, the teachers who are considered native uh, speakers of English, um, there are further categories that um divide them into like the more acceptable and the uh, 
uh, less acceptable speakers yeah. of English or teachers yeah. of English rather. Yeah, uh, interestingly, even white white English teachers in places like Japan and China and Korea also get discriminated because some of them have like their own regional accents, uh, like teacher English teacher American teachers who uh, who come from the Midwest, or um, uh, or even other white teachers like, for example. Um, uh, Irish teachers, Irish people, Irish uh, teachers have a, a specific, like a particular Irish accent, and even these, uh, or Australian and New Zealand teachers. So even these teachers are told to sometimes to modify their accent so that it would be sort of more American or more neutral. Yeah. So this idea of neutrality is actually a really big thing right now in the ELT industry, and it's actually one of the main. Um, topics that I'm covering in my dissertation, this idea of the what of a neutral English. So some a lot of companies now, uh, ELT companies now actually uh, in, I've been, I've been secretly stalking these uh, online ESL uh, Facebook pages as part of my research. And uh, what, I, what I've been seeing a lot is that uh, a lot of these uh, companies are uh, hiring Filipino teachers. And one of their requirements is that you have to speak with a neutral accent. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and what the, but but what does that mean? <laughs> what does neutral mean? Uh, there's there's nothing neutral about accents. Everything, all, all accents are kind of like have some racial and political, yeah, back uh, mo motivation to them. So there's nothing neutral about be, uh, neutral English. Yeah, and so I understand. So that, yes, there's a lot of bifurcations that are happening in different aspects or different parts of the ELT industry. And uh, what I presented today in the case of the Filipino teachers is just one example. And yes, you're right. Um, uh, th there's a lot of kind of bifurcations or segregations of English teachers into different subcategories uh, based on the needs and preferences of, of students, uh, based on the hiring requirements of schools. And so I think this idea of bifurcation is a useful framework for us to understand how depictions of uh, social difference are created through the use of language and other semiotic resources. Can I come in? Um, yes, uh, sir. Austin, yes, thank you. Um, no, because I think because um, I actually also have a question concerning um, the, the notion of bifurcation. All right. Um, it's a, I, I wonder, um, I, I wonder about um, how um, useful it is, you know, in, in operationalizing it. Um, is this really because the data show, you know, these examples of um, bifurcation? Um, or, and, and, and I'm just thinking of, because you mentioned earlier um, about questioning essentialisms. But then yeah. there, we also are looking using this 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 notion or this lens of bifurcation and seeing things in either this or that. Um, yeah. What if what if I think you mentioned something like cat, what if you look at categorization or recategorization or new categorization um, and not just simply bifurcation? I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not aware of, of the research mm -hmm. here, of course, but I'm just I'm just thinking of the implications of always looking for bifurcation, in other words. Yeah, yeah, for, definitely. That's a really good question. And I think that's also a, a limitation of this type of, of study because the study itself is ideological in nature. I myself, I'm engaging in this ideological work just as other people are do, engaging in ideological work that uh, perpetuates these sort of new social categories. So I think this is a, a, a a struggle that I'm currently facing as a, as a researcher myself. It's like, am I perpetuating stereotypes by identifying these social categories. But then, I think that these are, uh, what I'm trying to do here is to tease out what people are doing in their own ideological work, right? So for me, this is just kind of like interpreting uh, the types of categorizations or uh, or segregations that are happening in society. And uh, there are many ways to interpret this as well. It doesn't have to be a bifurcation. For example, like the, the notion of the other, right? The notion of the other is bifurcation because like it's us versus them. So th this idea of bifurcation has a long history in social science and, and, and humanities research of this process of othering, right? So othering is just another way for us to kind of like say the same thing. 
but for me, the idea of bifurcation works because it's part of a bigger theoretical framework, right? Um, of uh, actually Susan Gall and Judith Irvine, which I did not um, explain here in the presentation because it's a big theoretical framework and it, <laughs> I don't have time to explain everything. But basically what Susan Gall and Judith Irvine are saying is that in, uh, in that bifurcation is just one of the processes that lead to the segregation of social categories into smaller subcategories, right? There are many different other processes at play, uh, which I have illustrated in the presentation, but I have not specifically described in academic terms. <laughs> yeah. So yes, you're right. I think that the, the, the idea of bifurcation is, is very good, but it has limitations and we definitely need to acknowledge that in our research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's this one in the comments section. Um, probably you can just uh, respond to it as well. Um, it's from Sab, Saberola. Um, I feel like Filipinos should not accept offer that they feel is below their expectations. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why mm -hmm. we feel exploited is because we accept yes. the offer regardless. It is not just research that can address that. It should also be a change of mindset among Filipinos because yeah. clearly they know that we are good. They just also know that we will usually accept whatever is offered to us. Your thoughts on that? Hmm. <laughs> I, I, thought, I, I saw this uh, social media post that's been going around about like how Gen Z's are charging or like are demanding higher, uh, a higher starting salary uh, from their from their employers. I think that's uh, I think I mean, yes, I think they should. And I think Filipinos should demand a higher pay. But I think uh, one of the reasons why this is so difficult is that um, uh, of the structures at play, right? The, the racial and colonial structures that maintain these uh, hierarchies in, in the profession and in the industry. So even if Filipino teachers are very aware, right, that they're being exploited, they really can't do much because there is not a lot of choices, right? And a lot of these choices are, these limited choices are framed as appropriate, mm. right? So there is a lot. There's limited appropriate choices uh, in, in the in the industry. So uh, one of the one of the concepts that I'm also dealing with in my dissertation is the idea of ideological oppression, right? So ideological oppression basically uh, talks about how people in positions of uh, marginalized or disadvantaged people, right, sometimes engage in practices that they are very aware of are discriminatory in nature not because they want to do it, right? But because they, they are limited by their available options, the, the, the number of options that they have, right? And so uh, this is why I'm looking at a kind of a more uh, materialist approach in my research where we look at the interplay between agency and structure, right? You have agency as a, as a freelance teacher to do whatever you want, Right, but you can only do whatever you want within the constraints that are placed by the structures that are already in existence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yes, definitely, there should be more, you know, com more voices saying that hey, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to be paid better, right? And uh, a lot of people would say that oh, but uh, the industry is not professionalized. Anyone can teach English, right? That that's the very common uh, uh, excuse that companies make, right? It's not a professionalized industry. You don't have to be a licensed teacher to be able to teach English in these industries. But if if that is the case, then why do white teachers get paid more than Filipino teachers? Yeah. So there is definitely a need for uh, more equality uh, or e more equity, right, uh, in the profession. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Uh, because I think it's it, it's a very, um, it's a very complex issue when you actually now talk about choice, right? Because mm -hmm. our choices are not really like absolutely individual choice as well. Yeah. Um, there's a few more here, actually, this is by Ryan. All right. Um, he, you know, the information he says that um, you gave in the presentation, Brought, um, brought to mind the paper that he just read, right? 
um, and he's working on um, it, his for his dissertation. He says he aims to establish a strong foundation for non-native English-speaking teachers from the Philippines in the hiring process, the hiring process for teaching English abroad. Um, and then he he says he appreciates guidance, you know, uh, on how to approach and, and and accomplish this topic. Probably yeah. also in relation to this, um, could you talk a little bit about your you the process of interviewing the teachers and whether you also look into the you know the, the way they were hired or how they were hired? Are yes. there problems that went with it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's actually a very common uh, point of conversation between me and the teachers is the hiring process. Um, because the hiring process in, in, so there are many different kinds of uh, ELT schools, uh, ESL schools, right? So you have the Japanese Eikaiwa schools, which are English conversational schools. Uh, you've got uh, cram schools. Um, I think one type of cram school is in the Philippines is MSA, the, uh, uh, the, I don't know the acronym, but it's like they they they, they do like a lot of review. Uh, they're review centers, yeah, basically that's what. And there are also uh, language academies uh, that organize like summer camps for uh, for students from Korea, Japan. Uh, there's also the language learning centers, which are located in universities. And so the hiring process. In, uh, in these different institutions are very different from each other. So for example, in language learning centers, in higher education institutions, the hiring process is a lot more stringent, right? You can't teach in these institutions if you don't have at least an MA, a master's degree. So only masters, uh, uh, teachers with master's degree are allowed to teach in university language centers, but anyone can teach in like Eikaiwa schools or in Hagwon schools, right? Um, as long as you can speak English, that's perfectly fine. So the hiring process is not uniform. It's not homogeneous, right? And um, when, when you're engaging in that type of research, it's very important to contextualize the hiring process with the type of school or industry that the school is catering to. Yeah. So I think that's basically um, my takeaway from that. But uh, another thing is that a lot of these hiring processes are modeled interestingly, after BPO hiring practices. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. What I noticed is that's a lot of overlap between the ESL industry and the BPO industry. The ESL industry is almost transforming into this type of BPO-like uh, industry. And that's one of the reasons really why American English is being greatly valorized in the ESL industry because it feeds into the BPO industry, which requires an American English accent. Uh, for work, yeah. And so the hiring practice is in very interesting because there are also um, um, key performance indicators or evaluate, uh, evaluation or assessment tools for hiring, even for, uh, for work promotion are kind of very similar or very in parallel with the way that the BPO does it. I don't have a lot of evidence for this. So if anyone's interested in looking at this type of research, that would be really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, probably before we go back to the comments, um, um, Dr. Rafi, perhaps you can help me with the comments as well later. But um, Aljin um, has raised his hand. Aljin, um, perhaps you can ask. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Sir Roland. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, uh, first thing, I, the, the topic, the discussion was very relatable uh, in, my, in my perspective. Primarily because I have been indulged or I have been uh, into the uh, teaching industry for Koreans, not basically. And uh, I have seen and I have heard many Filipino teachers claim the very same claims that your uh, samples have had. Now, the question would be this, sir. Uh, how do you think can your research help non-native, quote unquote, English language teachers understand that there is in fact a need for them to assess you know, their worth as teachers, regardless of their race, regardless of their accents among others. Thank you. Uh, tough question. And I think that uh, for me, for me Langha, um, <laughs> uh, I think we need to acknowledge that we are this, this, this whole, um, 
industry, right, is in service of the neoliberal agenda, right? And this neoliberal agenda is in service of the state, the needs of the state. So this ELT industry is, what I'm seeing is that it's really turning into part of, of the Filipino export labor economy that uh, involves low skilled labor, right? Uh, low skilled labor, right? In inverted commas, like domestic work, construction work, right? Uh, entertainment work, for example, like a lot of uh, uh, Filipinos go to Japan to become entertainers, right? Or Filipinos who uh, work in cruise ships and things like that. And I think that the teaching industry is moving into that direction as well. And that's one of the reasons why the pay is low because it's equated to a type of low-skilled labor. But teaching traditionally has never been associated with, with low-skilled labor, right? So uh, I think that's one of the one of the things that we really need to address here is that the narrative created by the state in perpetuating these types of industries really need to be questioned, right? Yeah. Um, part of a neoliberal agenda of, you know, marketing Filipino teachers as competent English speakers, but at a lower price. I think that is uh, one of the main things that we really need to address. Yeah, and I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I don't have a solution to this because on the one hand, yes, I agree that there's no professionalization in the online ESL industry, right? And therefore you can't really demand to be paid higher if you're not professionalized, right? Like you can't demand, you can't pay a doctor or a teacher a low salary, right? So what do we what can we do here right on the one hand we want we want to give freedom to to filipinos to teach english in whatever platform they want right but how do we make sure that that the kind of education that's provided in these spaces are actually pretty good good quality education because in the in this neoliberal industry good quality education translates to a higher price yeah so it's very difficult. I don't have an answer to it. I, I don't think my dissertation will have an answer to this, to be honest. Yeah. If anyone can address this issue, that would be really amazing. <laughs> well, I will not try to address the issue, but you also have to consider that in the Philippines, even professionals are paid very low. Yes. So sometimes yeah. even, yeah, like we said, uh, what you said earlier, uh, teachers and um, doctors are, are not supposed to be paid low. Right, because uh, they're considered professional degrees uh, or or uh, fields of expertise. But then, teachers and doctors are also um, exploited in the Philippines. That's why many teachers and and, and other professionals go abroad to seek um, better opportunities. So you're yeah, right, and are... and uh, interestingly, I I have inter in my fifty interviews with fifty different teachers, quite a number of them are actually. LET passers, right? They are certain. They are licensed teachers who actually have actually quit teaching in public schools because online teaching actually pays them more. So, yeah. So even the professionalization issue is another issue. Because you have teachers who are leaving the teaching profession to actually join the private industry. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Even the ALTs that we uh, interviewed in Japan, they are licensed teachers here in the Philippines. And um, it's so sad <laughs> that they have to go abroad and you know, um, teach Japanese students to speak English rather than teach our young children to um, gain access to the language. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So uh, we have a few more questions here on our uh, chat box. Uh, I think we have three to four questions and we have time for, for more questions. So if you'd like to uh ask uh questions from Roland you may type in your uh even comments you also accept comments in the chat box and you may also raise your hand so we can acknowledge you and you can uh, turn on your mic and or your camera to ask questions okay so I'd like to um, read this one question from Nicole Duarte I think Nicole is from one of our uh, branches at PUP and I quote good afternoon I would like to ask could the current standards or qualifications in English language teaching 
also be considered as a variable why people uh, why, why Filipino teachers feel that they are struggling with being qualified or good in quotation marks teachers of the language. Uh, some of the standardized exams like DOEFL or TESOL require advanced levels of English mastery to pass. And while these are notoriously difficult for non-native speakers, I believe that the continuous need to adapt or fulfill these qualifications uh, to these would put pressure to our teachers. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, this, is, this is what uh, Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa has been saying about the ideology, about racial linguistic ideologies uh, that, that uh, uh, are models of language teaching, of in bilingual English language education, are modeled after a white monolingual English speaker. And a lot of these uh, preparatory examinations such as the, or entrance examinations such as the IELTS and TOEFL are modeled historically after a white monolingual English speaker, right? These exams are only relevant if, because uh, people want to study in institutions in English speaking countries. And so there's, a, there's an orientation towards Western models of English language teaching and it forces, it compels people from non-English speaking communities to adjust their language use to orient towards this Western idealized notion of a, of a, a, a white monolingual listening subject. Yeah, so TESOL and TOEFL are, are basically mach machineries, right? That help to orient uh, non-English speaking communities or uh, speaking com English speaking communities from post-colonial countries towards this sort of, towards the Anglosphere, right? And that puts a pressure on Filipino teachers, because that's not how we learn English at the first place, or that's not how we use English at the first place. Like, why do we need to learn all these like weird vocabulary uh, or dictionary words that we never use anyway, right? Why do we need to memorize all these dictionary words that we're not ever going to be using in our lifetimes? So yes, uh, that's a variable uh, that's very, very relevant to Filipino teachers feeling that they're not good enough, they're not competent enough to teach English, yeah. yeah. And since you're talking about the models of um, teaching English, uh, like in the Philippines, you are um, very much reliant on Western models. I'd like to share with you some of the questions that I gathered from our pre-registration form. So I clustered uh, the questions that are about models of English language teaching. Uh, and perhaps you can just focus on like one or two among these questions. Uh, the first question, uh, I'll just uh, read this in total. Uh, first, considering that the topic is on the contesting and refining of Western English language teaching models, what sets the Philippine English language teaching context apart from the Western context in terms of the application of the status quo that is represented by the dominant language teaching models from the West? And uh, a, rel uh, uh, a related question is, how can local teachers defy the Western model Models of English. The third is how do Filipino teachers reconcile their own teaching methods with Western models of English language teaching? And um, the last question: How do Filipino teachers challenge and reinforce? So there's uh, some sort of confusion there between challenging and reinforcing Western models of English language teaching in their classrooms. I think I've already addressed the fourth question in my talk uh, quite a lot. So um, maybe addressing the first question. Uh, what sets Philippine English language teaching context apart? Uh, what sets them apart is that they have to work harder. <laughs> they have to work extra harder to be like, <laughs> to achieve native like proficiency, to achieve Western norms. So there's an additional layer of challenge that's being imposed on Filipinos uh, in terms of teaching and learning English. So yes, what sets them apart is that the models are kind of the same, fundamentally the same. They're rooted in Western norms. But because we're not from the Western uh, part of the world, we have to work extra harder. And so how can local teachers defy Western models of English language teaching? There's already a lot of research on this. Um, um, I think a, uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna look at the most current uh, uh, 
research efforts in the field of applied linguistics, uh, translanguaging comes to mind, right? So how do we define Western models of English language teaching is to embrace uh, contemporary methods of language teaching, such as translanguaging, where we encourage our students to use all kinds of uh, uh, all kinds of linguistic, uh, basically their entire linguistic repertoire, right, to learn uh, an additional or a second or third language. Yeah, so there's a lot of work on translanguaging. I'm not a translanguaging scholar, but there's a lot of work out there, and if people are interested in, you know. Uh, coming up with creative ways to contest uh, or to challenge these Western norms in their language teaching practices, uh, they can go and look to uh, researchers who are working very intensely on uh, topics like translanguaging. Um, and another one is to really adopt uh, a decolonial or anti-colonial approach to language teaching. And so uh, Dr. Rwani Tupas is, uh, you know, the, has published several works on uh, uh, on how to uh, on thinking about decoloniality and how to kind of decolonia decolonia decolonize uh, uh, the the state of English language education or English language use in the Philippines itself. So people who have uh, uh, people who are interested in an anti-colonial uh, approach can also look at other scholars who are working in, in anti-imperialism and anti-colonial uh, practices in language education. So yes, I think those are some examples. And how do how do Filipino teachers reconcile their own teaching methods with Western? So the interesting thing about Filipino teachers who don't have professional practice, right, is that they actually come up with really interesting ways on their own on how to teach English. And I think that's a really interesting phenomenon, a really interesting sight uh, of pedagogy, right? Because they are Roland, placed. In, yes, Roland. sorry. Are you are you saying that the the well trained te the professionally trained teachers are trained in Western models of English language teaching? Well, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, like they are fundamentally, you know, trained in Western models. But you know, there's a lot of local, you know, local local practices as well, right? And that's where the decolonial approach comes comes into picture, right? Uh, maybe we can explore these spaces a lot more as, as researchers and try to figure out what are some of the local practices that we actually do quite well and you know build on those practices and integrate that as part of our teacher training programs so that's one way to decolonize uh, english language teaching or the training of english language teachers um and honestly i feel like some at some there are some spaces in the online freelance teaching industry where teachers who actually don't have a teaching background draw from their other experiences from their work experiences and they integrate that into their teaching and it's actually really interesting to see so like because a lot of these teachers come from all sorts of backgrounds they draw interesting insights from their professions or from their lives and they integrate that as part of their language teaching and how they communicate with their students. So I have one part, Heidi, who I was one of the participants uh, in my in my study that I presented in my talk. Was actually a farmer. She's a she's a farmer. She when she's not teaching uh, English online, she's actually tending to her rice fields. And so that actually becomes an important integral part of her teaching when she talks about her life as a farmer. Right, and so that could be a really interesting way for us to teach English to a Japanese or a, a, a second second language learner of English, is to you know uh, draw from uh, our experiences, our conversations, and come up with these kind of genuine, authentic conversations with students, and at the in the process, you know, helping them to uh, improve uh, their language skills rather than just you know, drilling them with grammar exercises or like vocabulary exercises or uh, essay writing, you know, uh, there can be more interesting and fun engaging ways uh, while at the same time contesting, you know, the kind of norms and practices that we're kind of used to uh, in, in our classrooms. Yeah. Am I making sense? <laughs> yeah, and then we have one uh, participant who's... Uh... And is raised. Perhaps you can give time for uh, uh, Isabel. Hi, Adorola. sir. 
<laughs> hello, sir. Hi. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you so much for that very interesting topic. Um, this is a concern coming from a person who's who actually experienced teaching um, abroad. So one instance that I've experienced would be my manager telling me that I'm the best in our group when it comes to teaching. But then I have a parent who doesn't want me to teach her kid because I'm not a native speaker or I'm not an American. That's what she said. But our mm -hmm. school, mind you, um, advertises foreign teachers as native English teachers. So how mm -hmm. can we change the mindsets of those people who feel that brown-skinned people are not native speakers at all or cannot really teach good English because they're not native speakers? So that's one like experience. There's another thing. Um, here where I'm working right now, color is definitely... Uh, something that causes discrimination or segregation among people. Um, one example is I speak better with, say, for example, um, reiterating, I have better pronunciation. Let's just put it that way. I have better pronunciation compared to this Iranian teacher that we have. But because mm -hmm. she's white skin, she's always in the pictures because it's for marketing. It's better for an international school. So how yeah. for me, how can, uh, on the notion of not a native and non-native speakers and um, racial discrimination. How can we remove such mentality among these people so that we won't experience discrimination anymore? Because definitely this kind of mentality affects um, the pay or the compensation that Filipinos should really get or brown-skinned people in general should get. Because definitely we won't be hired if we're not you know, qualified or good. But it's because of the color that we have. That's why we're not properly or we don't have the same privileges as the white. Is my question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's really tough, right? And yeah. I, I think I'm gonna go back to what I to one of the answers to to my answer to one of the questions that was posed earlier is um how do we sort of solve solve this issue? And I think one one way is to let to actually really communicate this with uh, the ESL companies, right? Because these companies, these ESL schools, they're not schools. They are companies. They are business entities, right? And they, all they care about is making money, let's be honest, right? So it's all about profit yeah. maximization. Yeah. And so they will find ways to maximize their profits in the best, in the most optimal way possible. And so a lot of these schools are operated by people who actually don't have a lot of knowledge or background in education. And so what we really need to do is to communicate what we find in our research and to transmit that, you know, that transmit the knowledge to these companies and to help them con to, to, to convince them that what they're that the kinds of practices that they're doing may be may may seem appropriate on the surface, but they actually have a lot of problems if you look at it under the hood. Yeah. So really communicating with companies and so changing the mindset starts from these companies who are perpetuating these ideologies at the first place. Right. And then again, uh, the level of the state, you know. Uh, for example, like the Philippine government, the state state level where, you know, all the state cares is about the labor export economy. So that's also something that we need to address, right? Because the, this ASL industry is becoming part of that type of economy, right? Uh, and 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 if we don't if we don't address the root of the problem, which is that, then there's really it's really hard to change people's minds and the parents, right? What I notice in a lot of, uh, in my interviews with teachers are that the parents are really the, <laughs> the problematic people. Uh, so I had an interview with one teacher who worked for a Chinese, uh, 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 sorry for the butchering of pronunciation. Uh, uh, it's a Chinese cramped school. Um, what, when she was hired to teach in this school, she was explicitly told by the Chinese company to say, if ever she was asked where she was from, to say that she's from New Zealand, right? Because like she was in the Philippines, she's Filipino, she was based in the Philippines, but she was told explicitly to tell the parents of her students that she is from New Zealand, that she lives in New Zealand and she's from there, 
<laughs> so the erasure of you know the of 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 this participant of this teacher's nationality and racial identity was really concerning because if that is a standard uh work practice then you know uh then that really feeds into the parents' ideologies as well, because they're being told by these companies that they're being taught by native speakers from places like New Zealand. Yeah. Um, Roland, can I come in there as well? Um, I'm just, you know, I mean, the, the conversation now actually, you know, the exchanges actually make me go back to your data. Um, mm. Because Somehow, because I think, I mean, also in the comments section, there are quite a number of questions concerning this, or at least um, probably indirectly related to this. Because you see, I think we talk about discrimination. Um, we talk about, you know, discriminatory practices within the field, for example. And yet, if, if you look at the data, or at least correct me if I'm wrong, because you know your data more, um, the, the teachers themselves seem to be discriminating against themselves. Yeah, <laughs> but it, they, they are discriminating, um, devaluing their own linguistic practices. Yeah. They yeah. are, um, in a sense, yeah. and, and, you know, what, you know where, where I'm going here, that somehow we talk about changing, you know, or uh, rejecting all these discriminatory, discriminatory practices. And yet we seem to be part of these um, you know, processes of discrimination. So, yeah. may tanong kanina, you know, how can we do something about this? So probably, siguro, you know, um, teacher training, professional development will have to really yeah. go, let us go through this. Para yeah. tayo mismo as teachers in the first place, do not discriminate against our own English. Yes, absolutely right. And that's where the duality of the listening subject comes from. It's the, the, the self-minoritizing practice the act of overhearing oneself right you overhear yourself and you make value judgments about yourself and you start to question whether what you're doing is right right and so you engage in these self-minoritizing practices for example what i i cited heidi who spoke five who speaks five different languages but you know had to go but decided to go through shadow training to correct her pronunciation because it sounded more bisaya than 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 what she wanted and so yes, there is a there is this practice of you know self discrimination, and I think that should stop, right? Yeah, it should you should be more confident about your English language teaching skills, and confidence can be cultivated by yes, you're right by good professional uh, training development programs. So these companies, yeah, I mean, fine, if you want to hire someone with no prior teaching experience, sure, but maybe you should provide the right training or not the right training but you should provide adequate training so that they feel so that your teachers feel more confident about the way they, the how the way they go about their teaching in in these online classrooms yes absolutely right go um there are also number in the number in the comment section about also models actually you know of english language teaching um whether it is this variety or or that variety, for example, what are your thoughts on this? Basically, of even putting up, like for example, of, um, you know, making a decision, for example, between I think Romy has a comment, um, uh, making a decision between should it be American English or British English or should we be consistent and so on and so forth. What are your thoughts on this? Um. I feel like uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something controversial, but I feel like the world English's paradigm is still stuck in this post-colonial notion of uh, we have our own standard. Standard is good. Uh, we are proud of our own standard language. But this is just a replication of a colonial mindset of standard language, right? This It's, it's, a, it's a fractal recursion or bifurcation of coloniality right I feel we I feel like we need to go uh, beyond that already and 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 stop treating languages as if they are that as if there are standard varieties of language because that that also restricts us in the way we teach uh, mm. our students so for example oh this is Philippine English this is American English this is British English mm. but 
even within American British and British English, there are a lot of regional variations, right? So like you have like the multicultural London English accent, which is different from let's say a, a Newcastle accent or a Manchester or Liverpool accent. So the idea of Asian Englishes or Philippine English or British English or American English actually obscures the complexity of languages at the first place. And so we need to go beyond that when we're teaching our, our students. Um, and I don't have a solution to this, but a lot of people who are working on translanguaging are doing things that are already, I think, beyond this notion of regional variation or like regional variation of languages that are tied to post-colonial identities, yeah. And one thing that I also noticed at, actually with this, the, the, the pattern in these kinds of questions, no, is that um, we, we have the assumption or we are taking the assumption that um, correctness is the ideal way yeah, uh, yeah. goal of, of English language teaching. So for if, yes. if our idea is ideal is correctness, rather than let's say being comprehensible, being in, understood, all right, then we will be stuck. Gaya na sinabi mo kanina, we'll be stuck with, you know, this refining varieties, you know, that it should, should yeah. it be this or should, should it be that? And in the first place, like, Apo, even if I tell you I'm going to teach American Standard English, I'm not going to be able to teach it because I don't speak that language in the first place, right? Yeah, and also so what does standard language mean? Exactly. <laughs> what does exactly. it mean in the first place? <laughs> exactly. We are yeah. putting up an ideal that will, that, that is never achievable from from our own ground precisely because yeah. it's it's it, we are you know our signposts are different all right yeah so i mean what if, echoing yeah you're right Yes, sir, sir Rwani, yes. Uh, echoing what Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa has been have been saying all this while is that no matter how well a, a, a racialized student speaks english no matter how good they are in it, their exams they will always be perceived in racialized ways by white yeah. speakers of English. Yeah. Even if they're very exactly. good at English, they will always say things like, oh, wow, uh, your English is really good, but uh, what? But yeah. uh, you, you have a little bit of an accent, right? So <laughs> like, it will never be perfect for the white listening subject. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. Over back, I mean, back, back to you, um, Isa and uh, Rafi, if you have more questions or where, how we can, we can move forward. Uh, there's one here, sir, from Rina again, uh, Rina Reynoso. Uh, just some additionals. The online English teachers that I have interviewed are not that confident at this, at they would mention that they are not mm. education or English majors. I think the next thing to do is really investigate or know what are the right trainings for them. However, yeah. there's no standard training for these teachers, as mentioned uh, the industry is not yet professionalized. Yeah. Comment yeah. On this. I mean, this is a symptom of the of the gig economy, of the freelance economy, right? Um, teachers are not hired as teachers. They are hired as independent contractors. And because they're hired as independent contractors, the responsibility falls on them to engage in their own professional development training practices. They're not paid to go for training. They're paid to teach by the hour, right? So there's no incentive for these companies to provide training because, because they're not employees, they're, they're contractors, yeah. So I guess one way to, that, this, so this is a, a problem that needs to be solved, right? How do you professionalize uh, this industry when the industry does not, is not incentivized to do so because it is a freelance economy? So that is, a, that is, a, question for a different type of research yeah perhaps P, um, P, the department of P, P, PUP um, Dr. Raffin, Dr. Isa um, this is a niche that probably you can <laughs> you can generate you know for more of series like this one yes especially that we have a lot of um, graduates from our undergraduate program who are uh, into uh, these kinds of professions in the BPO, in um, the non-professional English language teaching, in uh, foreign language teaching schools. So yes, this is a very good opportunity to like um, ask them about their um, needs so that um, 
maybe slowly we can professionalize the field and perhaps identify ways in which we can have like um uh people um develop their agency, develop teachers' agency, um and perhaps mobilize as well uh our students who are exposed to these ideologies so that you know um people in the field will have better understanding of who they are and what they should be. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's Sorry. another question here, Sir Roland. Uh, would you consider having Filipino English teachers that are teaching or based on other Asian countries like China, Japan, or Korea as respondents of your study will be picked up by other researchers? It would be interesting to note the cultural or social practices that influence the acceptance of Filipino ESL teachers overseas. Yeah, uh, definitely a, a potential area for expanding this type of research is to look at Filipino teachers working in uh, outside of the Philippines because it is a transnational type of industry. So one good way to expand this research is to look at the lived experiences of Filipino teachers working in uh, in other countries as well. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I have a few participants who uh, are actually overseas now, right? Uh, so at the time of the interview, they were still in the Philippines, but they've already left and started teaching in language schools in China and Vietnam. So yes, so that that, that goes to show that this transnational industry is very interconnected. And so if you really want to look at the bigger picture and understand this phenomenon better, then we need to take into account the lived experiences of the Filipino teachers working in other countries as well. Yeah. Okay, so we we have one more here uh, from Jonah Bell. How can English teachers possibly achieve the widely accepted standards for English teaching, considering that the quality analysts are Filipinos as well? Uh, uh, could the could this bring confusion to the language minoritized teachers who wish to improve in the said field? So uh, in critical post-structuralist linguistics in, in our field, in applied linguistics and crit critical applied linguistics and critical social linguistics, we, we do not support the idea of standard language, right? We do not, we, we want to get rid of this idea that there is a, such a thing called standard language uh, or standard English at the first place. Right. So people who work, people who do similar types of research as me would say that, why do we even have these widely accepted standards at the first place? Right. Right. So, uh, so, so the first thing is that, do we even need to first achieve these standards as, uh, at the first place? Is there a way that we can professionalize teaching without having to subscribe to some type of <laughs> standard English that's actually you know, that it actually produces um, uh, bifurcations of, or subcategories of uh, minoritized language groups. Yeah, so that's, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think teachers should be working towards a standard, right? But they should be working towards a type of, uh, a, a type of language teaching and practice and pedagogy that will enhance the experiences of both teachers and learners in more egalitarian, more, uh, equal and more equitable ways. Yeah. And in, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Some people might disagree with me. Oh, we have a question from FB Live from Sir Elmer Brabante. This is truly an engaging conversation on the Western models of teaching English language. My question has something to do with the place and even the role of AI. Uh, chat ah. GPT for one, place in this new paradigm. Could AI define the standards of teaching and research later on? Or could even someone make teachers irrelevant insofar as uh, AI could overtake our functions in the future already? It's already happening. Um, so I'm actually, uh, uh, so uh, part of my research is to actually look at the ways that uh, e these ESL companies uh, um, market their services, their products, and uh, there is there are there are already companies that are using AI tools as part of their assessment uh, 
So uh, there, there are some Korean and Chinese uh, companies that specifically use app-based app -based platforms uh, for English lessons. And then they use uh, AI tools to correct students' pronunciations. So <laughs> that's a very interesting phenomenon, but we, we should know that these AI tools are not apolitical, right? They're, <laughs> They, they, are, they are programmed by people with specific ideolog ideologies and mindsets about what a good pronunciation is. And so these uh, ideologies of an ideal or good pronunciation are translated into these AI tools and the AI tools kind of propagate these language ideologies such as the idea of a standard pronunciation or a standard language. And so these AI tools only become problematic in the sense that they kind of perpetuate these ideologies. Now, as to whether they will replace English teachers, I don't know, maybe, maybe in some aspects of language learning, but I don't think it, it will be able to replicate the, nat the kind of genuine conversations that students can get from English teachers in online English conversation classes. A lot of uh, students really like talking to Filipino teachers, for example, in these online English lessons. Uh, because uh, they're just really fun to talk to, right? And I, I don't think AI is already is at that point where it's fun to talk to yet, yeah, or engaging to talk to yet. Yeah. So um, I'm not an AI expert, but yes, there's already a lot of AI stuff that's happening in the industry and it's being used widely in assessment and that's actually really problematic, yeah. Uh, there's more questions. No more question here. How about from FB Live no more? So I guess uh, Roland already answered many questions as possible in the time that we have remaining. So we, uh, we move on to the next part of our webinar. Thank you all for your meaningful contributions of of their participants. We really appreciate your participation and engagement in this webinar. Now, uh, I guess we are ready to award the certificate of appreciation to the resource speaker. Allow me to read the citation. This certificate of appreciation is awarded to Roland Imperial for sharing his knowledge and expertise as resource speaker with the topic Dual listening subjects, Filipino teachers contesting and reifying Western models of English language teaching held via Zoom and Facebook Live. This certificate is given on the 10th of June, 2023 at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines Graduate School, signed by Dr. Emmanuel C. De Guzman, Vice President for Academic Affairs. Okay, there, for Academic Affairs. Congratulations once again, Roland. Okay, now let's hear from Dr. Uh, Rafael Michael Paz for his closing remarks. All right, thank you very much for this meaningful afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, the students who organized this event with the leadership, leader, uh, leadership um, I actually need the slides to continue with, with um, my spiel. But I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and uh, for the organizers of this event, the class of Dr. Tupas and Dr. Mirena. And of course, Roland, thank you very much for uh, spending time this uh, afternoon in the Philippines and early morning uh, from your end of the world <laughs> um, with us. And I hope to see more of you in the um, coming months. Um, both in our undergraduate program and also in our graduate programs at PUP. So may I now have the slides again? I'd like to invite everyone to our succeeding activities. Yes, so uh, next month in July, we will have Dr. Ariel Robert P. E. Ponce. Dr. Ponce will be uh, discussing about establishing inter-rate reliability in qualitative research. This uh, webinar will be organized by my class uh, in the PhD English Language Studies. And then in August, you will have Dr. Erswitzel C. Servano. Um, her work, Interlingual Reinstantation in the Process of Police Blotter Writing, won third place in the Loretta 
uh, Makashar Sikat Prize for Social Sciences for 2023, awarded by the Philippine Social Science Council. So we will have these two uh, in the next uh, months. We will have activities in August and um, in September, rather, September and uh, October as well. So please stay tuned on our uh, official uh, pages in social media, the uh, social media uh, pages of our Guild of English Majors. They're available here on Facebook and also on Twitter and Instagram. I also would like, if we can go back to the previous slide, I also would like to uh, yeah, um, invite everyone to the first uh, lecture, uh, the first lectures of our two professorial shareholders in linguistics, Dr. Isabel P. Martin and Dr. Ruani Tupas. Uh, their lectures will be delivered in November 2023. And again, we would like to uh, invite everyone to stay tuned on our official social media pages. We will provide all the information to you there. Uh, in February 2024, we will have the first EL conference, English language conference of uh, my department, the Department of English uh, in Foreign Languages and Linguistics of PUP. Our theme is English Language Studies Toward the Fifth Industrial Revolution, Traditions, Topographies, and uh, Trajectories. Our call for papers will be posted soon. So again, please stay tuned on our official uh, social media pages. And of course, uh, we can go um, now to the next slide. I'd like to invite everyone to our next uh, conversation, which will happen on uh, June 24, uh, two Saturdays from now. Historia Hanaita between the classroom and the real world. So Dr. Dupas and I will be in this event together with our invited panelists. So uh, we hope that you can make it on uh, this event. And um, we will have more for you in the next few months. And finally, I'd like to invite you once again. Uh, please um, move on to the next slide. To our graduate programs, our new graduate programs in uh, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Again, we have our Master of Arts in English Language Studies and Doctor of Philosophy in English Language Studies. Uh, we will be taking in uh, students in the summer term, that's August and September 2023. And our first term uh, will begin um, in September to October 2023. So please send a message to our social media pages, uh, the, the Guild of English Majors and the PUP English Language Studies and PUP GS Official. There we have uh, one of our social media pages is on screen right now. Do not hesitate to send us a message to ask information about the admission requirements and admission timeline. Uh, we will um, uh, be very happy to respond to all of your inquiries. Thank you again. Thank you very much for... Uh, for expanding. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rafi. So we have full uh, a full calendar of, of conversations this year, no? And the speakers that we have lined up are really top notch and are sure to provide uh, insightful and engaging discussions. Uh, for the participants, make sure to uh, accomplish the evaluation form, which is now flashed on the screen, and as, as well posted in the, the Zoom and Facebook live, live chat boxes. So the e-certificate will be available 10 days from now, <laughs> okay, uh, to be sent to your email provided for us in the registration. Up next... Uh, <laughs> Oh. Up next, singing of the PUP hymn. <laughs>
So before you leave the virtual classroom, uh, virtual room, please turn on your cam for the picture taking. Okay, on your queue. Good afternoon, Hi. Paul. I am requesting everyone to open their cameras. I will be now taking the screenshot. First gallery po muna tayo. Okay? One, two, three, smile. Lahat. Okay, next slide naman po tayo. One, two, three, smile. Okay, third page na po tayo. One, two, three, smile. For the last gallery na po tayo. One, two, three, smile. Okay na po. Thank you po. Okay, thank you so much na. So, that brings us to the end of the session. We hope that this online talk and conversation have been informative, unique, and delivered insights that you find valuable. Thank you for joining us today. See you uh, all in the next series. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.